Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. Your Honor, I derive much consolation from the fact that my colleague, Mr. Baldwin here, has argued the case in so able and so complete a manner as to leave me scarcely anything to say. However, why are we here? How is it that a simple, plain property issue should now find itself a noble to be argued before the Supreme Court of the United States of Podcast? Great, great. I think you said scarcely instead of scarce. I don't know. Who fucking cares? <laughs> Put your Amazon Kindle down. We're, you're, we're accepting that? Yeah, yeah. Four times the charm. Hi, everybody. My name is Griffin Newman. I'm David Sims. Welcome to Blank Check with Griffin and David. Yes. It's a podcast about movies, filmographies. We look at directors who have had massive success early on, get a series of blank checks to make their own crazy passion projects. Um, and sometimes not passion projects, but just are able to do weird things. Sure. That people who don't have massive success can't do. That's a good way of putting it. Less clearly than I've ever put it before. Uh, sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce, baby. Great. Uh, this is a mini series about the films of one Stevie Spielberg. Yes. Uh, it is called Pod Me If You Cast. That's right. And it's about Steven Spielberg, the DreamWorks here. His life post-Oscar. This is technically his first DreamWorks movie we're talking about today. Yes. Our first episode was about The Lost World, but that was, you know, it was a universal picture. We were flubbing it a little bit. But, you know, it was post-Oscar, and we wanted to talk about The Lost World, and we did not want to open our series with uh, Amistad. Amistad. Our second episode is about the film Amistad. Get ready to listen to a couple white guys talk about a white guy making a movie about slavery. Yeah. 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 I mean, on one hand, we're very qualified to talk about this because this movie was made by white men who shouldn't have made it. And it was made for white people. Right. <laughs> like, for on, real. On that hand, we are qualified to talk about this. But on the other hand, shouldn't we all be just disqualified from life and criticism forever? I agree. Ban all white men. 1997 is the year. The Titanic came out. And LA Confidential. Boy, people loved it. <laughs> Some good, good, good Will Hunting is that year? The Full Monty. Full Monty. Oh, a classic. Uh, there's no Pixar film, but America somehow stays strong and makes it through to 98 when A Bug's Life will sweep the nation. Paul Thomas Anderson makes his mark with Boogie Nights. Ooh, and what a mark it was. Uh, you've got, oh, oh, some, some great blockbuster sci-fi comedies like Men in Black. The Water Boy. <laughs> Air Force One. A very rewatchable. The film. Wedding Singer. Uh, the Fifth Element. Oh, great. The Man Who Knew Too Little. Uh, my Best Friend's Wedding. I'm a huge fan. Yeah, I caught some of that on TV the other night. That movie's still charming. Fantastic movie. Oh, God. Production began on The Phantom Menace this oh, year. Oh, how exciting. And also Amistad. The came Palm out. Door went to the Taste of Cherry. And Amistad did 46 domestic. <laughs> Uh okay you know you know it's box office total by uh I think I'm very close if you want to look at it I think it's forty six I know for a long time it Let was me just space this out as long as possible for a long time it was one of I think only four Spielberg movies that hadn't made a hundred million dollars forty four yeah. I was close no worldwide gross even listed wow it may not have even come out elsewhere it came out in Britain I remember it I remember it coming out in Britain I lived in Britain yeah people had almost odd fever. <laughs> No, they did not. Everyone was dressing up as John Quincy Adams for Halloween that year. <laughs> okay. What the fuck is this movie? Yeah. Okay, so the year is, I guess, I mean, 96, if we want to go into, like, the, the fucking development of this thing, right? Um. Yeah, he, well, let me let me try, yeah, let me try and get some info for you. He, well, I, you got, know, I got some information. I got someone for you, well, okay? I have some, but okay. Debbie, Debbie Allen. Yes. Do you know this? Yes, I do. Debbie Allen, the actress from Fame, mm-hmm. uh, got really into the Amistad story. It's a fascinating tale, right. right? Which we will touch on. And she got a bunch of the books, and she brought them to HBO Films. Something you want to note is that Debbie Allen is in the film Blank Check, in a small role as noted Yvonne. I recently Yvonne? Uh, got put on blast for the fact that our podcast isn't about that movie. Uh, okay. Who put you on blast? Uh, Two Dope Queens. <laughs> oh, yeah. You were on Two Dope Queens a while yeah. back. Yeah. At, at the time this comes out, yeah. 
So Demi Allen, who's uh, an actress, and she's a uh, does a lot of TV directing now, like yeah. a lot of TV direct. She's a very uh, prolific TV director. Right. Um, loved the story of La Amistad. She goes to HBO Films. And she's like, look, I read all these books. I think it's an interesting story. There's a good movie here. And HBO was like, we're kind of interested. And she goes to DreamWorks to see if they want to jump in on the ship. Joke Unlock. intended. Yeah. And uh, a good one? jump on the ship. And uh, and they were like, fuck that. We're going to make this whole thing. Yes. Yeah, Steven Spielberg, who I guess is sort of, he's casting around for something to do after The Lost World, right? Yes. But, but what I read was that, so... He's making Lost World. That's his first movie in, like, four years, right? Yes, and it's yeah. him doing something he's done before. It's a sequel, right? Which he's only done once before in his career. Yep. Um, and, uh, I mean, twice if you count the yeah, time. Yeah, he's, he's, he's not sequelizing his own Jones. properties, right? Okay. Um, that DreamWorks acquired it not originally with the intention to have him direct it. Yes. They hired a screenwriter. They developed the film. David and, Franzoni. And at some later point in time, Spielberg was like, you know what? Fine, I'll make it. Sure. And the movie very much feels like he was like, uh, yeah, I'm free Sunday. Let me direct Amistad. Yeah, it's worth noting that he did not even work on the post-production much of this film because yeah. he was making Saving Private Ryan, which right. comes out the next year. Like, So he, has, he did kind yeah. of squeeze it in. He has three movies come out within a 12-month period, right? I mean, Lost World comes out in uh, 14 months. Lost World comes sure. out in May. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This comes out in December, nice. and then yeah. Saving Private Ryan comes out the following July. Right. And so it's like he was overlapping this shit. I think to some degree he's got his, like, usual crew, and he's just going, like, you know what I like. Yeah, it was, sh- it was shot by Yunish Kaminsky, his yeah. now regular cinematographer. Right. After Schindler's List, it was edited, I'm sure, by Michael Kahn, his his editor. Right? But it's like he's shooting one. John Williams just did a nice enough score. It's fine. Hey, Oscar nominated. It lays it on a little thick. Yeah. Um, but it's like he shoots one, and then he's like, okay, you guys post this. Let me go film the other one. And then he films the other one. He's like, now you guys go post this. I'm going to film the third one. Yeah. And same part, Ryan feels like the only one he really took to the finish line. I think that he's partly like trying to get DreamWorks going, so right. he wants to work, you know, and he wants to get his name on stuff. And on its I face, think, this seemed like a big, prestige Spielberg movie that would yes, put them on the map. Maybe, but yes, that is true. But also, I think he probably thinks, you know, oh, maybe this movie might not happen if I don't put my name on it or whatever, right? Like, me, I don't know if he, I'm, that's a guess. Look, well, I don't know. And, and here's the thing. In most circumstances, I think you are right, right? And, like, there, you know, when people talk about, like, why the fuck did he direct Color Purple? That was not the right guy to direct that, right? Yeah, this is it's, what's w- worth noting. He had already made the Color Purple, and when that came out, people were like, Steven Spielberg should not be making the Color Purple. Like, yes. That whole argument had already happened in the 80s. Right. Yeah. And I think he, like, We've talked about he's pretty good at self-analysis, and yeah. he, like, took that to heart and yeah. was like, I'm proud of the film I made, but I agree I probably wasn't the right person to tell the story. He has talked about that since, yeah. Right? And The Color Purple is, like, a very well-acted film, kind of like this film. Yeah. But it definitely, yeah, it's it's got the it's the, the totally wrong vibe. Yes. Uh, you know, for the story it's trying to tell. Got a weird got, style. Yeah, it's... It's too, like, staid and stately. I mean, like, yeah, this movie's way worse. Well, it's like he's... This movie is worse than The Color Purple. No question. Yeah. Um, because I mean, the, the I think the screenplay of this movie is a mess. Yeah, Color Purple, the source material is so good, and obviously the innate story of La Amistad is fascinating. Mm-hmm. But this movie doesn't know what story it wants to tell within the events. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas mm-hmm. Color Purple is very well cast in, in a book that you kind of can't fuck up if you just tell it. Right, right. But there have not been a, a lot of good, um, like American movies about slavery. No, uh, at this point, especially sure. And uh, maybe he's just thinking, like, well, this is a story that needs to be told, and I've got the clout to tell it, like, whether or not I'm the right person for it. Well, that's know? this is where I'm going to fight you on this, okay? This because it's, fun. like, Color Purple, I agree that, like, even, okay, you know, the book's huge, but but maybe the movie wouldn't get made without Spielberg or at that certain budget. Or even someone who wasn't Spielberg might not have had the uh, cachet to cast Oprah and Whoopi, who were both, like, unknown at that point in time, right? Yeah. Like, he that's a movie where it needed someone like Spielberg with the juice in order to get it made, even if creatively that was the wrong thing, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But this film, he is now the head of his own studio. True. Which means he, he, you're, you're saying he could have. He could have. He could have, say, like George Lucas did with Red Tails, yeah. like, you know, made sure that the, you know, He could have said, I'm buying the rights or, for this, yeah. and guess what? Spike Lee, you're directing Amistad. That's, I want to plant the flag here at DreamWorks. Totally good call. You know? Yeah. He could so, have done that. You fucked up. And to that degree, this is like a real white privilege movie. 
like its existence is kind of okay. like I'm looking at a list on Wikipedia right yeah. now called list of films featuring slavery just to kind of back up what I was saying because yeah. like there really are apart from like exploitation movies there's yes and like racist movies from the right. 20s and, and 30s TV miniseries and I'm lots sure. of that right. obviously Roots had been a very big deal in the 70s yeah. like Return of the Jedi is on this list excuse me that is not a film featuring slavery Slave Leia though yeah that's that's what's cited as the uh, as the evidence to include it on this list. Do you know that our country's garbage? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad. Like, it's garbage when you look at the history of what's happened in this country, and it's garbage when you look at people processing our history by being like, well, yeah, but Return of the Jedi is about slavery, too, right? <laughs> That's a good call. The Rancor, he's a slave, right? <laughs> you know. You know, let's not. Let's not. Let's not kid around. Yeah. Hey, no, no fun. Hey, uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I don't know if uh, I'm jumping the gun. But no, I'll save this for later. Ben, cut that out. <laughs> he's probably not going to. Ben, please cut that out. Okay. Producer Ben? Yeah, yeah. The Ben Deucer? Hey. Producer Ben? That's me. The Poet Laureate? I've, I've written poetry. The Peeper? I'm looking at you. Birthday Benny? Hey, I'm 31. The Tiebreaker? You want me to decide? I'll tell you what. The Fuck Master? I'm good in bed. Not Professor Crispy? Don't you dare. Dirtbag Benny? I ride him. Hello, Fennel? You could say it to me on the streets or in the sheets. Graduated certain titles over the course of different miniseries. Such it's as true. Also went to college. Producer Ben Canove. Mm-hmm. Kello Ben. Yeah. Ben Say it. Yep. Ben H. Omelon. Yeah. Say Benny Thang. Dot, dot, dot. T. Ben Thousand. Yeah. Slash yeah, Ailey we, Benz. <laughs> we still haven't decided. I still really like Ailey Benz. Maybe it's Ailey Benz. I think it's Ailey Benz. Okay. I think Dan Didario is a good uh, judge because he came up with Say Benny Thing as well. Yeah. Uh, cut that out, Ailey Benz. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't even remember what you want. I don't out. either. Uh, uh, we're back. We're so, back. So, Amistad. Uh, yeah. Uh, what, what, what? Wait, wait, well, essentially what you were saying, and you made your point, so let's yeah. move on, is, yeah, yeah, Spielberg could have, uh, used his clout to get the right or a more suited director to tell this story. Also a more suited screenwriter, possibly, to tell this story. I agree. Also, not to be confused with Amadeus. No, they are different no, no. films. Very different. Ben, I went into ben, this, I was yes. like, ben told I was me about like this. we're going to play piano and stuff. <laughs> nope. This is real. Listen to this. I was I was excited. I was telling my roommates, I'm like, oh, man, we're going to watch this movie about a composer. <laughs> and I always like a good powdered wig. And they were like, what are you talking about, Ben? Uh, and then I realized my mistake. Yeah. Very yeah. different. Yeah. Amadeus, good movie. Yeah. Uh, best picture winner. I, one of my favorites. I hadn't seen it in a while. I was like excited, but uh, nope. This is a this is a sort of a different sort of tone. Yeah, kind sure. of movie. Um, so yes. you know, I, I, there's there's like obviously a huge ongoing conversation right now, right? Culturally, we have sure. about like who should be telling what stories. You know, yeah. how do we uh, allow a diversity of voices behind the camera, writers, directors, tell different types of stories in this. And, and also what kinds of stories should we be telling? Like maybe we don't need, you know, uh, the same story told over and over again. You know, maybe, maybe some Agreed. people are sort of sick of this slavery uh, Oscar movie or, what you know, as like uh, uh, the place for an African-American director to yes. like be heard. Or right. Yeah. And I think, yes, I do think therein lies the bit of the Gordian knot in this argument, which is like you go like, you know, this argument sometimes of like the people who have the right to tell the story are the people who have lived through this thing or it's very close to them. But you also don't want to say to any filmmaker, you can only make films about the things that you've lived through. Sure, of course. Yeah. Because, because A, then you're going to get stuck with a lot of fucking boring movies. Right. And B, you know, like about the same shit. what's yeah. exciting to me is that Ava DuVernay is doing A Wrinkle in Time. It would be really annoying if we said you're only allowed to make movies about civil rights cases. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. You know, sure. because it's, she should be allowed to make whatever fucking movie she wants. Yes, okay. That having been said, I think you can tell the difference between when a director is strongly connected invested. to the story and invested in some way. Whether it's because of their own personal experience <laughs> well, or a, a, a cause that they really care about. And this to me feels like Spielberg just being like, oh, that's an interesting story. But it doesn't um, feel like he's dying to make this movie in I any way. I think that's probably true. I would love to ask Steven Spielberg. Well, he's going to be our guest next week. About that. I do think that it's interesting that he eventually makes what I would say is a much better version of this movie, which this is feels Lincoln. like a dry run for Lincoln, this and whole movie. Now, yeah. Lincoln also has its flaws that were pointed out at the time. But yeah. they are way less glaring because he is making a, a more movie about the corridors of power and about like the sort of legislative and judicial, like, 
you know, weird, like, greasy work that you had to do to, like, make things happen. Yeah. Amistad wants to be about that, but knows it can't just be about that. So it's sort of Sinke's story, but not right. really, and it kind of sidelines him in a way that's sort of upsetting. Yes, exactly. And so, it like, the movie, as silly as this sounds, like, Amistad does kind of come alive in little moments when it's this, like, Court stately courtroom drama yeah. about like the weird legal uh sort of potholes like that they were trying to swerve around and like the like the bizarre house of cards that America had built about slavery in which it was like well we know that like this this and this is inhuman but the institution is still important we can't get rid of it or what you know like the weird political balances at play well because clearly that's what he was interested in and right. that was a milieu he hadn't worked in yet and you see that come to full. Bloom in uh, in Lincoln, sure. but watching this, you're kind of like, yeah, but th- that's not really what this story is. You're focusing yes. a little too much on the wrong thing. It feels like true. And also, the problem with this movie is it tries to have its cake and eat it. It tries to wrap things up with a bow. Where at the end, it's like they got their freedom, and it was so important in American history that this happened. And it's like, well, no, it wasn't. Like it took decades more for this to even begin to be addressed. In like, an, you know, the Civil right. War won't break out for. Another 25 years or whatever. That's, you know? a, that's a big thing. They keep on going like this might lead to civil war. And it's like indirectly you in know, a very it's long part tail of a much kind of larger way. snowball that, yeah, right. is beginning to build. Like, in but, the sense that everything that happened in between America's founding yes, exactly. and the civil war led to the civil war. Right. This led to the civil war. But it's like, OK, Lincoln, that's clearly the moment he was fascinated by. Right. He's fascinated by that shift and that conversation. And this movie tries to. And it was a move, you know, he wanted to make Lincoln for years. Maybe for years. not at this point, but he certainly for spent years. a long time trying to make that movie. But but um, I, he tries to use this story and this case as a microcosm for the larger shift that was happening, even though the story is premature in terms of where, how these movements actually, you know, yeah, I, took I hold. So. Um, there's, I just want to read the, the Wikipedia section here. Um because this movie got a lot of criticism for uh, historical accuracy. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, there's, yeah, no, there's just some, some good stuff Yeah. in um, there. Uh, yeah, like. So this is uh, Columbia University professor Eric Boner said, in fact, the Amistad case revolved around the fact that the Atlantic slave trade by 1840, outlawed by international treaty, had nothing to do with slavery as a domestic institution whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Congress, as it may seem, it was perfectly possible in the 19th century to condemn the importation of slaves from Africa while simultaneously defending slavery and the flourishing slave trade within the United States. Which this movie, at the end of this case, they make it seem like, and now everything's different. Mm-hmm. It's Roe v. Wade, which it wasn't. This case was this case. And no, I mean, it was an important case, and it, a lot of issues boiled up to the surface. But yes, of course, it did not lead in directly to anything. Like, and I, it was a weird incongruity that, yeah. There is such a striking human story at the center of this case that to try to make this case to mean something beyond what it did is like a little stupid to me because it's like just tell the story of what actually happened. Don't try to connect dots that are pretty far away from each other. Also worth noting that Eric Foner was once married to Naomi Foner who went on to bury Stephen Gyllenhaal and become Naomi Gyllenhaal and give birth to Maggie and Jake Gyllenhaal. And she wrote Running on Empty. But he is not the father of those people. Yes, she wrote Running on Empty. Uh, Amistad's problems go much deeper than such anachronisms as President Martin Van Buren campaigning for re-election on a whistle-stop tour. I, no, in 1840, okay. Eric, not campaign. chill out. Who gives a shit? That's fine. It's a <laughs> cinematic device. I am out on Eric Foner with that. Like, you um, can have him campaigning. Yes, it's an incongruity. They, they didn't campaign sure. like that yet. America was really too small, and the way the elections worked were, you know, you, you don't have to reach the populace at that point in time. Okay, come on. I agree. We have to understand that he is campaigning for president. It is okay to show him on a train in one scene. Here's another thing. Uh, Morgan Freeman's character didn't exist. Yeah, that's uh, that's okay, though. At all. No, but it's. I think it's important for the movie to note that those uh, like kinds of activists existed at the time. Sure. And insert him. You know, He doesn't play any kind of role in the movie is more the problem. Yep. So in, in, He's more just there to be like... In real life... Uh, everything that his character did was done by Austin Pendleton's character. Austin who's Pendleton's only in like character. one scene where okay. he's trying to translate before they find Shiwetel Ejiofor. Uh-huh, right. And he's right, sort of the right. mousy guy. Right. Um, And he sort of like got things in motion and hooked sure, sure. McConaughey up and then sort of takes a back seat. Yeah. I think they wanted to see different types of activists. I, w- I think they wanted to have a a free black man in the film, which yes. makes sense. No. 
and also not just make it a movie about a bunch of white people helping. Yeah, but at the same time, maybe this is where you should start to realize, like, oh, this is going to be a tough story to sell, uh, to tell, sorry. Maybe make a movie about sinking. Yeah, maybe, or just maybe have different people make it, and yeah. just, you know, yeah, I kind you're of offsetting a lot of the sort of questions people are going to ask about the movie yeah, when they see it. That's what I kind yeah, of do. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Okay, so. So the plot of the movie is, uh, you know. Uh, so the opening of this film is very strikingly made. Uh, I, I, I want to say a few things off the top of the bat. Yeah. This is a very well-acted movie. This is yeah. a gorgeous-looking movie. It's yeah. a well-designed movie. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the problems are more inherent to what we're talking about. The script's also, a mess. And the script's a bit of a mess, and the plot just kind of veers. It feels like you're reading a history textbook at times. The best best thing you could say about this movie is it's well-intentioned. And that is a huge criticism, right? It's yeah. that sort of backhanded thing, like, uh, okay. You know, like, that's how I feel watching this movie. Right. Uh, okay, Steve. Okay, okay. Fine, yeah. It feels like a movie designed to be watched in history class over, like, five periods, except for the fact that so much of the history is incorrect in this movie. I watched this film in history class. Yeah, it seems like the place to watch it. Uh, ben, I think you also did. I did as well. Yeah. Hey, I, I think And you we still can... thought it was Amadeus? Yeah. I, I don't know. I misremembered it okay. in my mind. Uh, hey, one thing, though, that yeah. we can all agree, damn good muttons. Yeah, that is true. I loving them chops, baby. The hair in this movie is great. Yeah, good man chop. I've been told before... <laughs> Hopkins is especially. Yeah, know. he looks great. I've been told before, um, like, when uh, when I'm acting and stuff, like hair and makeup people, the hair people are always like, you 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 should really do period stuff. Because, like, my hair naturally kind of looks like yeah. Matthew McConaughey's hair in this movie. Mm-hmm. And my facial hair, I cannot grow, as you see before you, a strong, consistent beard. Right. But I could certainly get that little... Tufts. Right. So I, I'm just throwing out my little flare gun right here. Anyone wants to cast me as some sort of... I could see you as a meek Union soldier in the Civil War or something like that. Yeah, or, or even just kind of like a, a Rick the intern in a colonial era. Do you know what I'm saying? Sure. Like the assistant to... It's the the day of the big war draft. Maybe the the preacher, the new preacher at like a church. And he's very nervous. Very nervous preacher. Who yeah. Like doesn't, you know... And, like, someone's coming to you for, like, sex advice in the 19th century, and you're, like, stammering and looking down at your Bible a lot. And then you spill coffee all over? Yeah. Hey, wait a second. <laughs> he, br- he breaks my abacus. <laughs> Sorry, I've been sipping on my dick all day. Uh, I, here's another part I've always wanted to play. Mm. A piano player at a saloon. That'd be fun. And I stop playing the music. And then the guy goes, did I tell you to stop playing? And he shoots oh, at my good. feet. And I go, dun, 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 That'd be good. I want to just go on a brief little uh, side track here. Oh, boy. Okay. I know, I'll I allow it. Um, I just saw a film that at this point will have come out and maybe been nominated in four and won Oscars. I have no uh-huh. idea. Uh, that's also a white guy making a movie about uh, a piece of black history that's maybe under-discussed. In this country, called Hidden Figures. Oh yeah, but it's a uh, quite a, quite an excellent movie. Really, and yes, and uh, you know of its type, which yeah. is the sort of inspirational true story drama. But it's very very good. And Ted Melfi, who I've never given two shits about. Yeah, but, uh, he, I, the same boat. Yeah, I would not say Ted Melfi is the reason that movie is good, but he does a competent job. Good cast, good story. Exactly, and he gets and out of the way. He gets out of the way, and you know who's great? Obviously, the lead women are fantastic, but you know who's great? The is, cause. Yeah, Kevin Costner. Can I terrific can I follow a motion to officially start calling him the cause? We strip Bill Cosby of the cause rights and cause. I think I think it's too loaded. I think you can't do it. I want to bring the cause back and give it to a man who deserves the title. Ben, can you isolate? I want to bring the cause back <laughs> and just <laughs> just put that out there. All right, no, all right. The cause is a great man. Anyway, and I speak of course of Kevin Costner. <sighs> so, uh, the plot of Amistad is that there's a slave ship called right. La Amistad. Yeah. Uh, which is coming from Cuba to the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has, uh, there's a mutiny led by Cinque. Cinque? Cinque. 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 Uh, that overthrows, uh, this is like the first, the whole part of the first part of the movie is just on the boat, right? It doesn't cut anywhere else. Yeah, like first 20 minutes are yeah. just on the boat. Um, and then so, the first time we cut off the boat is to Anna Paquin. Oh, it's Queen Isabella. Great little two-scene performance, actually. Yeah. She's really funny. She's really good at hopping on that bed. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, like uh, they they overthrow the Spanish slavers. They basically take over the ship. There's like they leave the navigator alive. But and... even like the very opening of this is so striking, where it's him trying to pull the okay. nail yeah. out of the floorboards, and it's like very 
muscular, visceral filmmaking. Mm-hmm. It's really just, frightening. There's like a lightning storm. You know, it's like pitch black, heavy shadows. Um, and it is like it's 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 kind of stirring, you know. And then you watch this very upsetting, very violent. Like even though you know this character is the hero, you know this is a necessary revolt. Yeah, no, but it's it's supposed to be tough, and it is tough. I like, like that the, he makes the, it tough. I yeah, do yeah. like that he makes the it. The violence is yeah. in, very visceral, and right. uh, he's played by Jamin Hounsou. We should note uh, in not a debut. Perf- was it a debut performance? He had he done in stuff. very very little before this. He's in Stargate. Right. Right. That was his only real part before Yeah, this. apart from that, he'd had, like, a couple uh, extra parts, essentially. Yeah, yeah, I think Stargate was the only film he had been in where he had, like, a character name. He had done, like, voiceover on one thing, I believe, and then he had done, like... Yeah, it was a small part. A club goer and shit like that. Um, but, uh... We'll talk about him in a bit. We'll talk about him in a bit. Do you know who Steven Spielberg uh, originally offered the role to? No. Cuba Gooding Jr. Oh, sure. Okay. That would have been a disaster. That probably wouldn't have worked. I guess Cuba Gooding Jr. was, though, he was like a hot name at the moment. It was right was, off the uh, Oscar. Coming off yeah. of Gary Maguire. Um, but Bajaman, quite a discovery in this film. Uh, excellent in it. And more, just, you know, Jaiman Hansu, he, you know, he is uh, from Benin. I think he's, you know, he that yes. is an African actor, probably better suited to the role of an African than someone like Cuba Gooding Jr. would have been. Uh, I agree with that, yes. I, he's, I think Jaiman Hansu like, grew up in France, but, uh, you know. He I'll say, has, uh, uh, yes. Uh, but he has the right accent. He has the, you know, he's, he's, he's uh, great. Cuba Jr. has also never shown any facility for uh, dialects or doing any voice different than his own. That's a good point. Are you thinking of OJ? Yeah, but even general. I mean, he just, he's able to be Cuba Gooding Jr. nothing else. He was pretty good in OJ for someone who was not doing a good OJ. I agree. And this yeah. is a large argument that I have with a lot of people. I think objectively that's a good performance in a bubble. If you can't get over the fact that he's not OJ, then I understand that and I can't fight you on that. Right. But I think it is a good performance on I think its, it's own a merit. Performance. It's just, it's it's just yeah. not if accurate you're depiction for an of OJ. Simpson. Of OJ yeah. you're, uh, yeah. It's not even a, a really good representation of him. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know? But I think it's a good performance on its own. Um, okay, so yeah, open with him, the revolt. The revolt. They try to get the navigators to sh- steer the ship back to uh, Africa. But uh, the navigators, whatever, you know, get them to the shores of America instead, probably hoping. I think they were they were definitely hoping to get back to Cuba, but they were at the very least hoping to, uh, you know, not have to go back home. Like they were hoping to get protection wherever they landed. Can I just read Shaman Hansu's character names before Amistad? Uh, yeah. Okay. Ex-boyfriend in Without You, I'm Nothing, which is a filmed version of a Sandra Bernhardt monologue, right? <laughs> Nightclub doorman in Beverly Hills 90210, prisoner on bench in unlawful entry, and uh-huh. then he was the voice of Moisey in Killing Zoe and Horace in Stargate. So oh, Amistad Zoe. is like a huge pop for him. Yeah, absolutely. That was all he, he had done he was before. A, I think he was a model. He'd been in music videos. He, I he believe was... he was discovered homeless. The story is that he was a homeless guy, and they were like, that's the best-looking person I've ever seen. Yeah, and he and arrived in France, yeah. he dropped out of school, he became homeless for a time, he met a photographer who introduced him to a fashion designer who said he should be a model. Right. By the late 80s, he was a model with a career in Paris. He is one of the best-looking people in history. He is an absolutely gorgeous person. It's insane. And, I mean, now he's like 52, still pretty much absolutely gorgeous. They land in America. Yeah. Yeah. But not in America. The film for which Jaman Hunsu received his first his, Academy Award nomination. It was his first, but it should have been his second. After this? Yeah. 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 Yeah, he should have been nominated for that. Was it Category Confusion that did him in? Well, that's... I he think, got a Globe they, He got a Globe for lead actor. Right. They pushed him as lead. This movie, I would argue, doesn't really have a lead. No, but you could push him as... You could, but it's... Yeah. It's his tough. role is a little sidelined. I mean, this is the thing you get into. If you were to push him as lead actor... But you have to because you're pushing Anthony Hopkins as supporting. Right. So you have to push him as lead. But here's the problem. You look at, like... He disappears for vast parts of the movie. Right. And so if you look at the, the dudes who he would have been contending against in 1997, they all have a lot more screen time and more scenes than he does. There's no question. So here. it's hard for him to compete because it's, like, less meaty of a lead role only in the sense that he's not that leading. You know... It's a weird year because he's up against, okay, Damon in Good Will Hunting. And this is the Golden Globe nomination right. for Best Actor Drama, just to be clear. Roberto Benigni. No, he's comedy. Yeah, that was a comedy, quote unquote. Right. Ha 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 ha. Holocaust. 
<laughs> um, Leonardo DiCaprio for Titanic was another nominee. What's weird about this year is the only nominee in the dr- uh, the only there's only two out of the five or uh, drama nominees because you've got Nicholson, you've got right. Panini, and you've got I guess Ian McKellen. Maybe he didn't get one. Yeah, I don't know. Nick Nolte for Affliction is he in there? Oh, maybe Nick. No, he's not. He's not in the Globes. Mm-mm. Wow. So who are the other? Who? Daniel Day Lewis in The Boxer. Oh boy. Which is a decent performance, but yeah. a film that did not hit. And no one ever talks about. Peter Fonda in Yuli's Gold, oh, who right. got he the got nomination nominated. and yeah. won the Golden Globe. What a weird year. Yuli's Gold. Not a bad movie. But that was clearly biased because it had gold in the title. And Leonardo DiCaprio. For? Titanic. Big hit that year. But was he in two? You already said he was nominated. Was he nominated? Oh, oh I was talking about that. Did I not mention him yet? Did I already mention him? Hunsu, DiCaprio, Damon. You got it. Fonda, Fonda and Day Lewis. Lewis. Okay, yeah. you got it. Uh, yeah, Hunsu Hunsu's uh, phenomenalness. Uh, when it starts out, very good. I was like, okay, this is going to be his story, and it is at times. And then it gets to America, and this movie kind of does like a relay race. No, a relay race. A relay there race. We there we go. Right? Yeah. This movie just kind of passes the baton. Is like, hey, why don't you take it for fifteen minutes? And then yeah. McConaughey's like, I have to go to the bathroom. Morgan Freeman, can you take these two scenes? Sure. Yeah. And then Morgan Freeman carries it, and then he's like, hey, Shaman, it's been a little while. Do you want to? And he's like, yes, I'd like to take over the film. And then he gives him the film for a little bit. But then like, he realizes, like, Phil, this finish line's actually a while away. Who's this guy with big white mutton chops <laughs> in a watering can? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's this waistcoat yeah. wearing, Hopkins dude? shows up and says, sorry I'm late. <laughs> <laughs> now, Hopkins... Is still movie star Hopkins at this point? Yeah. Like he'd been in Nixon the year before, maybe two years before. Yeah, I mean he's on an Oscar nomination in a mode right now where he gets nominated almost every time out. Right, he's getting nominated almost every year. Is that true? Well, he got nominated for Remains of the Day. Yeah, well, he's fantastic in that. Right, yeah. he got nominated for Nixon. Good he got job, nominated Hopkins. for this. It's when Hopkins is still a good actor who does good work, even if yes, he can be a big actor. Yes. Uh, and then after Amistad is, uh, and and then the next year he's in um, The Mask of Zorro, which is great fun. Uh-huh. But uh, after that is when he starts to, uh, I mean, I think we talked, did we talk about this in a previous episode, how much he phones it in? Yeah. Like, but like how he like, uh, what? I think we talked about an episode that hasn't been released Yeah, I think yet. we talked about next week about yeah. how he literally is like, we'll read a script and be like, great. No acting required. Yeah. And that's what makes him sign on to a role. Uh, yeah, he got four nominations. And this is his last one, isn't it? Yeah, four nomina- Here's the thing. He gets four nominations. In like seven years? Yeah. 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 So it's silence and less. Lines. Yeah. It's between, his last one is 97 and his first one is uh, is 91. Right. 92. And he should have been, he, was he nominated for Howard's End? He wasn't. He it was. Sh- you know, he easily yes. could have been for that. It was He's, Remains of the Day, Amistad, Nixon, and this. Like, you easily could have nominated him for Howard's End, which yeah. is 92, in between silence and yeah. Remains of the Day. He's great. In, he's okay in Legends of the Fall. But in whatever. Sure. He's fine. wonderful in Nixon. One of my favorite uh, performances. Never seen Certainly that. my favorite performance in him. My number yeah. one of that year. Wow. One of the most underrated movies ever made. Uh, Strong words. Really. And then in 96, he, he's in Surviving Picasso, which is too terrible for him to even him at that moment to get a nomination. But like <laughs> yeah. certainly that's what that movie is trying to do. Sure. And then this year, he's in The Edge and Amistad. The Edge is like an action movie starring Anthony Hopkins. Well, that's when he starts doing some more of that. Like, even like the the Mission Impossible one scene where he famously got like $5 million. No, that's two. He's in two, not one. I'm saying the one scene oh, in oh, Mission I see. Impossible. Oh, I see. So, He's got the one scene. I think he got paid $5 million. For well, he, he, I guess he deserved, I don't know. <laughs> hey, yeah, I'll say this. The Edge, it holds up. The Edge is fun. It's good. And then Mask of Zorro, the next year, that's an action movie. He has some action scenes. He rides a horse. Yeah. He does some stuff. But he, like, I mean, it's a stuntman probably, but, you know. But then look at this list after Mitro no, Black. Hopkins does all his horse work. <laughs> he does. He always does his horse work. <laughs> and his whip work. <laughs> yeah, Meet Joe Black, which, I mean, that's a mistake on every single level. Right. right. I mean, one day we'll do Martin Breast. We will definitely <laughs> well, do Martin in Breast. The, in the deep, deep. Breast cast. Instinct. Oh, oh Cuba. <laughs> it, Titus. Tight, good movie. Good movie, but very unsuccessful. Uh, yes. Right? Didn't help him at all, but it was and a good movie. Hannibal, huge hit. Okay, Hearts and Lance disaster. No, then, no. After Hannibal, he's done. Right. It's ter- oh, Well, no, well, because he does do Red Dragon, which is also a, a decent hit. Anytime he does Hannibal, he's okay. Right, but he, Bad Company, The Human Stain. Have you, have you ever seen Bad Company? It's yes. one of the worst films it's ever. It's horrendous. 
Alexander. Then he gets into this mode. Oh, he's like, kind of fun in Alexander. That's where he's just like, you know what? Yeah, let, you want you need Noah guy for ten minutes. But that's the problem. Then he starts getting this mode where, like, when he shows up in Noah, it's just like, oh right, of course he's in this. You know, like you expect him to just be in that kind of zone. He in th- Beowulf. Like in Thor one, he literally is asleep the whole movie. Except there's that one moment where he's like, "What you are?" Like where he like yells at Loki. Can I one scene? Can I correct you? He's not asleep. He's in Odin's sleep. Yeah, he's in Odin's sleep. He's in a deep Odin sleep. <laughs> deep, yeah. Um, I always had kind of assumed that this nomination was just like the kind of Meryl Streep, like, they loved Hopkins. No, he's great. I That's the thing. I'd never seen it. I always had thought it was sure, like sure. High Tide Raises All Ships. I don't know it was if a big I would there. nominate him. But it's a nomination-worthy really, performance. It's, it's a showy, strong, supporting it's performance. A, it's a classic Oscar performance, you know, classic, like, so up their alley, especially and, back yeah. in the day. And it's funny. He's he's funny. He's like, got a watering can. Yeah. Uh, he he walks into one of Janusz Kaminski's famous uh, pools of light. Oh, yeah. That's now showering. It's it's rays he, on he a little He walks into flower. a few of those pools. Yeah. It but I'm saying pool. because he has so much water, Janusz Kaminski, watering. Yeah. This is the other thing. I think Spielberg likes to make these period movies because he's like, yo, only natural light. Yeah. Love it. I want pools of light coming in from every window. And also, you see the American flag in the window, and it's like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, baby. Oh, boy. Uh, he lays it on real thick in this movie. So just to finish the plot of the movie, it's it's both complex and simple because it's yeah. like, yeah, this you know, the ship arrives in the coast of the Americas that everyone's like taken into custody because they don't know what to do about this because slave trading is illegal in America at this point. Yes. Uh, and these are illegally traded slaves. But, like, or are they? Because, like, it's not illegal in Spain. Like, so, like, there's a whole matter of, like, where uh, where did this trading happen? And, like, what does America do about it? Like, is this a Spanish issue? Do you send them to Spain? Right. Is this, like, uh, an issue where it's, like, no, they revolted of the, for their own freedom, which is their right, because slave trading is illegal. So they're, they should be let go. You know, like, there's a dipl- diplomatic thing going on where Queen Isabella, Anna Paquin. A little girl. A little girl who is the Infanta. Uh, she wants to get the slaves back, you know, whatever. She thinks it's like Spain's property. And you've got abolitionists who see this as an important case, and they're right, like they want to litigate it. So it just turns into this legal drama. Yeah, and it's like they they do the trial, and then the judge is going to rule in favor of them, and then the mm-hmm. abolitionists are like, uh, let's get a judge who's going to be in our pocket. And they get no, the- no, not the abolitionists, the... Uh, Martin Van Buren. Oh, yes, the, yes, the, yes. The yes, pro sorry, slavery. Sorry, the pro slavery. Martin Van Buren, the president at the time, doesn't want to piss off the South because he wants, he's running for president. He wants to win some Southern states. Yeah. So he, yeah, he. And he's got some whispers in his ear who are he like. He interferes ah. and gets a little, a young and handsome Jeremy Northam in, in, right. planted as so the, the judge. So that's the first, this movie's like a, a couple aborted trials. Like they do. Yeah, there's a lot of yelling in, in the, courtrooms. The first trial, McConaughey's whiffing it. And then they go back. McConaughey plays like this trial lawyer who. And he's good in it. The case. I think he's great. Uh, that was the moment for him. He'd been, he, is he about to be in contact? Yes. He'd been in a time to kill? Oh, contact came out earlier that year, right? Is it 97 or 98? Uh, I'll look it up. You know, that's when he, he, it's just been decided, like, time to get this guy. This guy's going to be hot. Like, well, he'd yeah. already been in, like, Days and Confused, obviously. He had been in a Miller Lite commercial. He was discovered by a casting director at a bar who said, we're casting this Days and Confused thing. Would you want to come in for this part? Because he seemed so much like Wooderson, right? Right. He does that. He fucking pops. One of, like, the best sort of, uh, you know, newcomer supporting performances in a movie ever. Like, he just, like, blows in that movie, right? Blows off the screen. Yeah. And uh, everyone's like, oh, this guy's got some interesting charisma. But it was like, is he a character actor? He's obviously handsome, this or that. He does, like, the fucking Texas Chainsaw, The Next Generation. Sure, he does a lot of shit. But then the big thing is he had an audition for a small supporting part in Time to Kill. Right. And he read the script, and he was like, I want to play this lead guy. And his agent was like, you can't play the lead guy. You're Matthew McConaughey. This is a big movie. They're not going to cast you. Sure. And he went into the audition and said, I'd like to read for the lead guy. Right. And in the room read for the lead guy and blew them away, and they cast him. And it was like, who's this unknown guy? He's the lead in a Grissom movie. And then Grisham. Grisham. People Magazine, the next Paul Newman. They dubbed yeah. him, right? Which doomed him for a while, I think. Well, he, he got, yeah, and you're right about Contact. That came out the same year. The Newton Boys comes out in 98 and is this hyped movie that flops yeah. for both Linklater and him. So that kind of like puts them on the back burner. He's in like Ed TV, which I think he's wonderful in, but it's another flop. And people that's are 99? Like, that's 99. And yeah. so people are like, oh, is this guy? And he's in U571, which is not a flop, but not a huge hit, you know. And he's the lead, but it's not really a vehicle for him. And then he gives up on being a good actor and for like five solid years is basically just a shitty romantic It's like the lead. worst. You know, it's like wedding planner, 
uh, How to Lose a Guy in Ten Days, uh, Sahara. Well, know, I remember that thing. Failure to launch. How to Lose a Guy in Ten Days did we bizarrely. Are we are Marshall. How to Lose a Guy in yeah, Ten Days did, well. did bizarrely well. No, a lot of these movies did pretty well. It was just, but that just one seemed... was like a mega. I mean, that did like a hundred million dollars like fifteen years ago in it's February. The Wedding Planner. Wedding Planner did not do as well okay, as How to Lose right, a Guy in Ten it Days. Doesn't matter. My point is, I remember when that movie opened so big. In, like, Variety, they were like, it finally happened. They finally found the way to make Matthew McConaughey a leading man. Boring, romantic. Right. And it was just like, I think everyone felt like they were trying to, like, this guy should be connecting. He's a good actor. He's really handsome. He's naturally charismatic. And then once they put him in a shitty romantic comedy and blew up, they were like, oh, that's who he is. And he just bought the company line and, like, no, but it wasn't along. until 2011 yes. when he makes The Lincoln Lawyer, which is a cruddy movie that he's great in. Right. And then starts making weird movies like Bernie, Killer and, Joe, Killer Joe, and Mud. Yes. And then obviously he's in True Detective and he's in Dallas Buyers. You know, that's when suddenly everyone's like, oh, right. Oh, right. Like, he was really good. He's a really, really unique, like, cinematic presence. Like, he is special. But 97 is interesting because Spielberg picks two guys who had been anointed by the media as the next great leading man. Who's the other one? Vince Vaughn in Lost World. Oh, yeah. Who right. at that time had that same no, kind of right. buzz. I mean, right? we, we talked about him. Yeah. 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 And the problem with Vaughn was Vaughn would actually be good in a Jurassic World movie playing the Ian Malcolm part. Yeah, he'd probably be good at that. I right? mean, it might feel hacky, but he'd be good. At that point in time. But he tried to make him too straightforward a leading man, right? And he misused him. Sure. In this movie, I actually think he uses McConaughey well, but the movie wasn't there for McConaughey. And so, like, it was a big deal that, like, oh, Matthew McConaughey's, like, one of the leads in the new Spielberg movie. Oh, he's, like, the co-lead in the new Zemeckis movie with Jodie Foster. Right. And then both those movies kind of underwhelmed. Well, the, and I, also, I think he's solid in both of them, but they put a stink in both on of them, him. But he also feels a little tacked on. Agreed. And he's charming. Yes. But you're also like, do I need this guy in my life? Like, I don't know. Like, you know, maybe he's just a supporting character. Like, maybe he's just a funny guy. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. I'll also say, I mean, he's obviously not as strong an actor in the, in those two films as he is now. He's just become no, such a like a, a full deal five tool player. Roles. This is yeah. not that interesting a role. No, but he's got some really good scenes. Yeah, he's pretty good, but like the arc of his character is like they think he's a trial lawyer, but he shows them that he's better than that. He's an excellent lawyer, not just a you know huckster. I did, I did the whole thing. Right. I did his whole art. And then Jaman Hunsu is like there in the background of all these scenes, and you're like, this is the most deeply felt performance. Yeah. Like, uh, Jaman Hunsu is a dude of just like insane emotional reserve, right? Well, yeah, he's someone who looks, yes, uh, haunted behind the eyes. Yes. He's got He's got incredible eyes, and like, he can sell so much in a look. But everyone would always make jokes about, like, in, in Blood Diamond, like just how visceral and emotional yeah, he well, is. Yeah, in Blood Diamond, he does a lot of, like, screaming freaking and out. crying yes. and freaking out and all of that. And he's just, it never seems forced from him, right? No. He's really good at it, always feels earned. I think he just, he has that in him, right? And in this movie, when he's just sitting in, like, the stands watching something, you're, like, so invested in him. Yeah. And his journey, his arc of what he's going through, is fascinating as a character, yeah. but it's kind of seen through the eyes of these other people being like, oh, he is interesting, which A, yes. feels a little condescending. Well, it's a, yes, it totally does. And B, we don't need to see it through McConaughey's but, eyes. Just make the movie well, about that's him. That's the thing. Well, the problem with the movie, obviously, is that part of the issue that the, the space at the time was that no one could speak Mende like, or any of the other languages that right. the people on this uh, boat spoke. So uh, like, the, a lot of the middle chunk of the movie is about them trying to figure out how to communicate with them. And, like, how to make their case, right? Right. Should we tell Jafar in his first performance? So fucking good. What a good actor. He's fantastic. What a good I just actor. Hit the table. He's so good in this movie. Um, uh, he plays James Covey, who's a real person who could speak Mende. Yeah. He was like, I forget, I forget the exact, I can look up his story. He was a slave who was saved, right? And was then recruited into the he army. Was, he was uh, sold to the slave holding camp, placed on a ship. But the ship was intercepted by a British warship, right. so he was freed. He joined the British fleet. He eventually ends up in New York, and yes, and he's discovered during this case as someone. He's someone who could speak Mende and English, and he's yeah. But but you're saying okay, so there's you know the problem is okay the characters can't communicate with each other for most of the movie, but they make this decision where for most of Jaman Hunsu's scenes he's not subtitled, and so the scene has to play out as as a translation is required or yeah yeah. Hey, which you could do it from his perspective and just have most of the movie be subtitled, you know? Yeah, no, I I know. I, I don't know, man. Like, I, a lot of mistakes are made. So, And we should And then in the middle of the movie, we see, like, this fuller dramatization 
of La Amistad's, like, you know, the, the passage yeah. it's making across the Atlantic his Ocean. His capture. His capture. Yeah. And then this very, very, very horrifying sequence where they, like, offload a lot of right. the slaves into the water. They just drown them because they're too heavy or, like, they don't have enough food. Like, whatever. But we don't know what's happening when it, like, we just know that these terrible things are happening. And then we cut back to the courtroom. Eventually, it's sort of deciphered that that's what was happening. Right. It's very visceral. It's yeah. well done. Yeah. Okay, Steve. You know, it's how I feel about this movie. Like, okay, what do you what What are you trying to do? We all agree, you know. Yeah, Edgio for we should. He had been Othello in a very famous okay Donmar production in London in the nineties and ninety five, I think. So that yeah. was like that's where his initial heat came from. And Spielberg puts him in this movie. It's great. Um. So yeah, first trial, McConaughey's whiffing it, and he comes up with a good hook, and they're like, great. And then uh, the pro-slavery people are like, get him out of there. They hire Jeremy Northam. Jeremy Northam, who's also sort of a hot young actor of the moment. Uh, British. Yeah. And then it never really worked. I love him. I think he's a good actor. Yeah. Great actor. Uh, But he he never really had the career. I think they thought he was going to have a star. But he is fantastic in so many movies. Hey, do Um, you think uh, like some of the like smaller bit kind of people, like there's like racist number three? Well, I gotta say, that's one thing I do think. It's one this... thing he's got a lot of in, like, yeah. in fucking uh, Schindler's List. It's yeah. like, yeah, you need to play, like, anti Semite 7. You need to play a like, collaborator <laughs> 4. And the, the Louis C.K. bit about the girl who's goodbye Jew, which is Jews. a good bit. Um, I, I will say, uh, P. Postlethwaite and uh, David Pamer. So, Postlethwaite is in Lost World. We, sh- you know, we, we talked right. about him. The Postlethwaite is so over. So, he does. This is the one two punch of Postlethwaite. The Postlethwaite yeah. was. Over and continued to be over. And then he left us possible sweating he is, until his death. I guess one of the quote unquote villains of the movie in that he's the lawyer for the other side. Right. But it's a nice measured performance. That's what I was gonna say. Character Both actor. he and Pamer don't do mustache twirling. No, yeah. Pamer plays John Forsyth, who is the Secretary of State, who and is I, interfering. I like that's like the audience is gonna know that they're the bad guys because they're on the wrong side of history. So right. there's no need to play them as more villainous than they are. They're played as just people doing their jobs who are fighting for the wrong thing. Absolutely. Right, and okay. I think both both good character actors. That's yeah, that's fine. I just thought I we give them a little spotlight. Yeah, I think they're both good. Yeah, yes, yeah, but that's and all it, there is to say. About and that. It is a thing to dra- I guess it's an important thing to dramatize that. Yes, at the time, people thought too academically about this, and people like were compartmentalizing, and they just sort of ignored all these evil things. Yeah, like the banality of evil. I guess the banality of evil. Yes, but it's been done better. It will be done better again. Yeah. You know, I'm doing a lot of shrugging right yeah. now. The way the movie progresses is they keep visiting with John Quincy Adams. Right. Who is a former president at this point in history. I, Morgan Freeman's the main one dealing with him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Morgan Freeman is, I guess it's established that he's had dealings with him in the past. They're buds. Quincy Adams, son of John Adams. He was our sixth president, and then he became a congressman he after became a, the a presidency. beer company, yeah. No, that's Sam Adams. Oh, fuck. Boy. Who is also who is the relative of John Adams? Yeah, but I knew it was in the family. John Quincy Adams, you know, he's the only president who he returned to the House. He was a congressman yeah. after he was president. He became this like very well-respected statesman. He right. wasn't like a well-respected president, but he was a well-respected post ex-president and one of the great kind plant of, waterers of his time. Yeah, he was kind of the Jimmy Carter of his day. Where everyone was like, you know, you, you you had a troubled presidency, but you know, we all respect and like you, and you you seem like a good guy, and. uh so they keep visiting with him, and he's watering his plants. And they're like, you should really be part of the case. And he's like, no. Well, in no, America, there is this so. thing. This, nah. um, uh, but he was an opponent of slave power. Hated which, it. You know, he, he, he was an abolitionist yeah. uh, in his later years. And eventually they get him on board. Well, yeah, they plant Jeremy argues Northam. before the Supreme Court. They think Jeremy Northam's going to be in their pocket, right? And then he's just like, he has the moment in the church where he's like, I got to do the right thing. So he does the right thing. And then, and then of course, and the the tribesmen, you know, the the uh, uh, the the prisoners, former prisoners, former slaves of the ship celebrate, and they're told, "Well, no, it has to get appealed." Right. So, well, there's like ten minutes where they have to like explain the concept of an appeal. Yeah, they kick it up to Van Buren, and Van Buren's like, uh, you know, it goes to the Supreme Court. Right. John Quincy Adams gives a big speech. Right. McConaughey writes him a letter and is like, "Hey, I know you're busy. If you could just come by, it would really be a big help." And he comes by and he gives a big speech that apparently he delivered in one take without flubbing a line and Spielberg was impressed with. That's pretty impressive. Good yeah. job. It's a long scene. Holy shit. That's it's a fe- really yeah. long scene. Spielberg said, because uh, I, 
I had mentioned in our Lost World episode that at the time of Lost World, Spielberg said that Postal Fate was the best actor he'd ever worked with. Mm. And then a year after, he said Hopkins was the best actor he'd ever worked well, with. Well, Steve is pretty easy with the praise. Right. But he said he didn't. Spielberg was like, uh, I always thought it was like uh, goofy when you had to call people sir or dame or whatever. And then Hopkins showed up, and he did that speech in seven minutes and w- without flub, and he was like, okay, you're Sir Anthony Hopkins. Sir Anthony Hopkins. Yeah. Uh, was he Sir at the time? I'm he must find have been. out. Oh, I don't know. But then uh, Hopkins brings it home, and he d- d- nails these speeches, and they, they free him. That's the, yeah, that's the movie. Sir. God, he got knighted early. Um, yeah, that's the movie. And uh, uh, There's the free us speech in the, in the court. Give, a, which give is, us free. Give us free, which is uh, very powerful. Tremendously well- Done by Jaimon. He's Hansu, a great actor, and uh, which I, is when they he stands up and he just says, "Give us free" over and over yeah. again because he can't speak the language, but he has at least gotten that much, and he's just trying to, you know, impart like the whole. You know, these are people who are not born into slavery. Yes, They're, you know, we see them being kidnapped in Africa briefly, mm-hmm. and uh, it is, you know, I guess interesting to draw that distinction i don't know he just Where, wants to get back home to his family and then yeah. the end title card they say that he got back home and, and his, his country was in civil war and right. his family was gone and they were probably sold into slavery and you're like that's devastating i wish the Ooh. movie was about that guy Ooh. you do see that um uh, peter firth who's an actor i adore mm-hmm. uh he plays captain fitzgerald of the british navy who uh like the british navy you know slavery had been abolished in britain already and so the slave trade with the british navy was fighting against slave trade and you see them blowing up this famous slave fortress in Africa that was, like, used by the Spanish. Mm-hmm. And I think that we have that because Spielberg wants this big, cathartic, like, you know, large-scale scene. But it feels so tacked on. It it's feels like, that's very not what this tacked is fucking on. about. And, again, it feels like him trying to put a bow on something that doesn't really deserve one yet. Yeah. So that's, that's, a, that's a problem. But uh, it's, it's, yeah. I like Peter Firth. You know, he plays that captain. He he dictates the letter. Yeah, there's so many good actors like, in this. Yeah. You know, to Secretary of State John Forsyth. Like, as you said, like, the fortress doesn't exist because we blew it up. Yeah, okay, clever, good. Two comedy points. Yeah, but, he gets two right, comedy he points. Gets, he gets two comedy points in the movie. John Ortiz taps him on the shoulder and goes, two comedy points. But, but I, I don't know. I just, like... Yeah, I mean... I mean, they, they thought this movie was going to be a big Oscar play and a big box of success, and it was neither. I think it got two nominations in total, or three. Four. Cinematography, supporting actor, uh, uh, score, and what was the fourth? Production uh, design? Costume design. Yeah, I mean, all... All deserved. It's a good-looking, well-designed I, I think movie. the music is, is way overdone in this one. Oh, you yeah, know, you don't. The score is not... But that was in the days where they had ten score nominees, so you had to fill it out. Oh, because it was comedy and drama. That's when they had drama. the comedy and drama scores, which, honestly, bring it back. I liked it. I would it. love that. I loved it, because I like a good comedy score, and they rarely get the tip of the hat they deserve. But, nonetheless. I mean, but then... Nevertheless. You, you, nevertheless. Nonetheless. Nonetheless. Never the not. Never the not. Okay. We're stalling. Box office. Okay. Might as well. Yeah, sure. I don't. Yeah. The film came out December twelfth, nineteen ninety-seven. Okay, a quarter limited of time release that we only... covered a lot because this is a month after Man Who Knew Too Little, and a week before Titanic. It's right before Titanic. Okay, which helped bury this movie at the box office. Simply time. noted, it made forty-four million. Now, I will say this movie opened in three hundred twenty-two theaters and yeah. obviously expanded later, with a per screen average of fourteen thousand dollars, made four point six million dollars, number five at the box office. That is. Great. Huge. I mean, you could really tell. Really good. The, the DreamWorks people were tapping, patting each other on the back Monday morning going, we got a blockbuster in our hands. Well, look. And then it expands and goes nowhere. The film cost 36 mil. It made yeah. 44. It, whatever. It, 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 it didn't hurt nobody. You but know. It, it left no cultural mark. No. Okay. So it opens number five. Uh, number one at the box office. It's a horror sequel. Halloween H2O? No. I still know what you did last summer? No. Scream 2. Correct. I think this has already been covered in our Titanic episode. I think that was in the top five when Titanic opens to thirty-two million to make a hundred and one on a twenty-four million dollar budget. So it's a great okay. hit. Number two is a film we've definitely discussed on the podcast before. We named we used the turned its title into a verb in our Star Wars. Oh, flubber, flubber. Yeah, uh, this is a lot of rep with our, our Titanic in box office. Third yeah. week, okay. it has made fifty-eight million dollars. Still flubbing along. Oh yeah, these are actually yeah because the third right. movie we also discussed in our Titanic episode. Mouse hunt? No, <laughs> no. Uh, it's a comedy. It's a ripoff of another movie, a drama. 
starring two hit TV stars. Pretty sure we discussed this. Oh, movie. oh, for Richard Poor? Richard Poor with Tim Allen and Kirstie Alley. How weird that you, that's a correct way to describe a movie. It's a comedy that's a ripoff of a drama it starring is. two sitcom stars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Amish, you know, hiding out with the Amish. Yeah. The comedy. Number four is a sequel to in a hit film series starring none of the people involved in the first two entries in this series. Ooh, interesting. From a director. That you have noted before. In a good way or a bad way? You think, yeah, I think, I don't know. You think I kind of like him? Well, you like a scene that he directed and and acted out once on this podcast. I acted out. You said you cried to this scene. Scooby-Doo? Yeah. So the director is. It's the director of Scooby. Oh, 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 oh. It's Raja Gosnell and it's Home Alone 3. It's a fun way to arrive at that one. (laughs) <laughs> so I should admit, uh, you know, for Richard Porter opened number three at six mil. Home Alone opened number f- Home Alone three opened number four at five mil. Yeah, these are bombs, people. Yeah, this is not a good time. And then the biggest movie of all time opens the next weekend. And then uh, Amistad is number five. Some other movies: The Rainmaker. Oh yeah, remember that? Vaguely, yeah. It's yeah. got dames. The dames. It's got dames. Uh, Devitz. Uh, yeah. And it's from a little director called Francis Ford Coppola. And then it's the last movie he makes for like ten years, right? Basically, it's not until. Um, is it not until a, a uh, youth, youth, youth without, without you, you, or is it tes, te, testo tetro? Tetro comes tetro after comes youth without after, you. After, yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. ten years later. Alien Resurrection, the worst of the Alien films. It's the worst of the main Alien film. I'm not including Alien vs Predator. It's better than Alien vs Predator and Alien vs Predator Requiem, Requiem or whatever. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, it is the worst. I still find it watchable. Looks good. Got some good ideas, uh, but uh, it's a disaster. I haven't tried to watch it in 15 years. Saw it twice back then at the peak of my Alien Obsession. Hated it. We'll maybe try to rewatch it in anticipation of Alien Covenant. Uh, very excited about Alien Covenant. Maybe I shouldn't be. I don't care. I don't care. I'm excited. Fool me once. Shame on you. <laughs> Fool me twice. Shame on you again, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Will me five times? Yeah, I'll keep going. I like Prometheus. One day I'll defend it on this podcast. I like it. I don't hate it. I, I just think it misses the mark in a lot of regards that frustrate me. But I like it. You've got Anastasia. Oh, Anastasia. You probably liked that as a kid, right? I actually you never saw cartoon it. movies? Never saw it. I like cartoon movies. But, but please, I have rarefied tastes. I don't fall for any animated pablum. <laughs> Even at age, uh, how old are you? Probably seven. I was eight. Seven or eight. I was eight, yeah. Eight going on nine. Yeah, Anastasia, that's that's uh, the beginning of the last gasp of Don Bluth. Uh, but he does make Titan A after this one. Yeah. Yeah, which I didn't realize until recently was co-written by... Uh, and? I don't know. Ben Edlin Crater the Tech. Oh, I gotta wow. ask him about that sometime. You should. Yeah. Uh, the Jackal, which you've discussed. Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil is in there. Oh. Clint Eastwood film. Yeah. Wow, uh, thrilling. <laughs> uh, Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Oh, great. Yeah. Oh, and opening in limited release in 10 screens, making $35,000 per screen. Pretty great per screen average. Deconstructing Harry. Oh! The Woodster's back. The and he's getting an Oscar nomination. For screenplay? Yeah. Yeah, The Woodman. Uh, not the worst movie he ever made. Not the best. No. I'd say it's not even one of the 15 worst movies he's ever made. <laughs> That's probably true. That's a benefit to making 15 probably movies. Probably not even one of the best 15 movies he ever made. <laughs> Just, just sort of. It's part of that middle fifteen yeah. out of forty-five. Where you're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, okay, yeah. yeah there yeah. are fifteen that exist. What's that in between celebrity and sweet and lowdown? Like, we have, like, where is that in the? I put chronology? celebrity lower and sweet and lowdown higher. Yeah, me too. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I want to say like, Amist- we we knew Amistad would be a slightly slow going podcast. Yeah, we're not the people to talk about it. Anyway. No, we're not. The movie's really, and he wasn't the person to make it. Yeah, it's just sort of like there's things we're not mentioning here, probably like. You know, like, there's probably, like, little scenes or details that do stand out in some way or other. I don't know. Like, I don't want to give this movie short shrift. It's interesting that it exists, but I think it's been wisely forgotten. Let's do performance review. All right. Let's run them down. Here now is the performance review. Morgan Freeman, first bill. Which is insane. As Theodore Jodson. He's first billed, I think, because otherwise then the billing would be McConaughey or Hopkins McConaughey, you know, then Honsu. Well, okay, so in the, the end credits, is, they go purely alphabetical. 
Above the poster on the top. Above the poster, it's Freeman Hopkins, Hounsou McConnick. Yeah. Which is not alphabetical. No. And is more just... Hopkins is second on the poster? Yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah, I I mean, it's, he's this is an NAR performance. He's just showing up and he's doing Freeman. He's fine in it. He's always NA? good. Oh, no, I no, can require. require it. He's yeah, solid. Yeah, he's fine. I can't even think of a huge scene that he has. He's fine. He's mostly in the background. Yeah, he is. It's watching a, other people do stuff. Yeah, it is an odd performance. It's odd, but he's solid. He's Morgan Freeman. He does. He's there. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's a soft a soft pass. Yeah, I'll give him a pass. Uh, for some reason, I'm going by Wikipedia because I can't even be okay. bothered. So, so second listed is... Nigel Hawthorne as President Martin Van this Buren. Is, okay, this is how they do the crediting at the end of the film. They go alphabetical. So, but then A B C D E F G H. I guess F is the first in the alphabet for this cast. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Nigel Hawthorne. I don't. I don't. I mean, I think he's okay. Yeah, he doesn't he, have a he, lot to do. He had feels a little broad. He's a good actor. Yeah, he had been in The Madness of King George. Yeah. Uh, you know, a couple of years earlier. He's got Tarzan two years later. That's going to be huge for him. He's the voice of the dad in Tarzan. Disney's they, oh, Tarzan. Oh, in the film? Sure. Yeah. He's, uh, he's quite nice in The Object of My Affection, which comes out okay, the sure. next year. Sure. Oh, he's quite good in Richard the Third, the uh, the Nazi era of Richard the Third with Ian McKellen. That's uh, quite a good movie. Yeah. So soft pass? I think it's going to be a lot of soft passes, my friend. All right. Yeah. Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins is former president John Quincy Adams. I mean, hard pass. Yeah, but when you say hard pass, that sounds negative. I know, but that's why I'm doing it now, because now it's like a bit. I see. Yeah, I like him. Jaiman Hansu as uh, Joseph Sinke. The hardest of passes. Right. MVP, and he's MVP, right? Without question. Yeah, yeah, right. Matthew McConaughey as Roger Sherman Baldwin, pass. attorney Just at law. A nice, solid gentleman's pass. Yeah, B. Yeah. Uh, David <laughs> what Pay- the fuck are we doing? <laughs> David Paymer as John Forsythe, the Secretary of State. I mean, he's kind of my Watto in this movie in more ways than one. Can you name which Secretary of State he was? What no. number? Uh, what number? Four. 13. Oh, geez. Okay. Uh, Pete Postlethwaite is William Holabird. I mean, yeah, it's the po- was later the lieutenant governor of Connecticut. Uh, great face. Great face. Uh, pass. Stellan, <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm not even taking part. Stellan Skarsgård is Louis Tappan. I'm going to say a soft fail. Yeah, he doesn't register. He doesn't register. Uh, Skarsgård, also in Good Will Hunting this year. Yeah. Hollywood's starting to, starting to make him happen. Yeah. They're starting to get Scars fever. You know, Scarsy had been around forever, but it's really, it's really this year that he starts hitting. In Transfer Hollywood. stateside, yeah. Because then after this, he's in Ronin, Deep Blue Sea, mm-hmm. Time Code. Well, that's not good. But you know, he's in a lot of he, Mamma Mia, the Glass House. Right, Mamma Mia. Mamma Mia is like thirteen years later, man. I'm going. Crazy. I always want to talk about Mamma Mia. No, uh, Anna Paquin is Queen Isabella of Spain. I mean, she rules in this movie. Right? Yeah, she rules. A plus. <laughs> Uh, Thomas Milian is Angel Calderon de la Barca y Belgrano. Okay, I fail. Uh, I think he's okay. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. Why, why are we doing this? Uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor is James Covey. I mean, great. He's great. He's a great actor. Pass. Uh, John Ortiz is Pedro Montez. Pass. It's, it's fine. Paul Guilfoyle as attorney. He's good. He's the guy from CSI. Fine. Pass, I guess. <laughs> Peter Firth, I already praised him as Captain Fitzgerald. I'm going to say fail this. We can fight over something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Ty Racist Baker? number five. <laughs> Xander Berkeley as Ledger Hammond. We shouldn't keep doing this. This is this is a Jeremy terrible Nor- idea. Oh, we should put Arliss Howard's in this movie for a second. Oh, yeah. As John C. Calhoun, who was, I believe, the vice president. Yeah. Uh, No, he was an ex-vice president. He's just a racist at this point. Is he the one who makes the crack about there's nothing more depressing than a former president? And he goes, uh, not st- you, sir. Yeah, maybe. Van Buren, I don't know. So that was a great performance from you. Good job. Uh, yeah, so we did well. Hey, here's the next good news. Next week, same pair Ryan. Fun one. And we have Richard Lawson on that episode. Yeah, and then we, a lot of great movies that... After that, we're going to have AI, oh, one of my favorite Spielberg movie. One of the best. And Minority Report. Oh, Holy my God. Shit. Catch me if you can. The romp. Wow, I definitely we, shouldn't stop listening to this <laughs> podcast in spite of this episode. And then we're going to talk about another great movie that we won't name because then you might groan. We'll get there when we get there, and then we'll stay there, stuck, unable to travel for many months. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. We will. yeah. Hey, every mini series, we're going to have one of these sort of weird no, of episodes. Course. I don't know why we're it, freaking out. Like, it always we, happens. We discussed fucking Piranha 2, and like, God knows what we've discussed on this fucking podcast. 
Sensate. So, yeah. Someone pointed out That's that Sensate's thing. doing a Christmas episode now. Are yeah, we going to cover the Sensate I think Christmas we episode? Gotta run. We'll, we'll okay. see. We'll see. We'll see how our schedule goes. Okay. Well, everyone, uh, happy f- February. Uh, <laughs> enjoy listening to this episode. Of, yeah, about us talking about Amistad. Yeah. Uh, Oscar season is upon us. Uh, which uh, Blanky Awards will be coming up soon after this. Oh yeah, Blanky Awards. Excited for those. Oh yeah, we should maybe do those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. So that's great. Everything's good. Every one feels great about everything, and America is still dying. Um, America in shit shape. Yeah, it's in shit shape. Uh, also in shit shape. Uh, my bathroom. Uh, I'm saying this on mic because I want to see if my bathroom's still in bad shape by the oh. time this episode comes oh, out. This is my segment for the record. Oh, Ben, for the record. I thought it was calling the shots or whatever. No, it's for the record. Okay, for the record. Ben, here's your segment. For the record. You like the expression called his shot, though. You like I that. love that expression. Yeah, yeah. I only have four expressions. I use them all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the record, Rogue One. Pretty good. Okay. Oh, you're just calling that. Yeah. You're saying, okay. I'm calling it. So we're recording this right now at the end of November, and Ben's calling that he's going to like Rogue One, which at this point, the episode where we review Rogue One will have come out six weeks earlier. Hell yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you for listening, everybody. We have nothing else to we right? We're good. We're good. That's the end of our episode. Please uh, keep listening to us in the future. Yeah, they will, I think. I, I think hope they so, do. too. Um, uh, remember to rate, review, subscribe. All true. All right to your senators. Please. Yeah. Fucking resist Donald Trump. Yes. Whatever the hell he's doing right now, and God knows what it is, it chills me to the bone to even right. think about it a couple months out. But fucking, yeah, resist Donald Trump. This has been a UCB Comedy production. Check out our other shows on the UCB Comedy Podcast Network. 